I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Nobody has ever had a uh, perfect uh, employee. Nobody has ever had a perfect job recommendation. Nobody, nobody has ever done anything perfectly except, of course, Jesus Christ. And so we, we're not surprised when we hear in our gospel lesson this morning that, that Jesus does things well. Um, but the thing we have to remember is that that's not just during his time here on earth, not just during his ministry, but that is still true of him today. He still does all things perfectly, perfectly well. We think on that as we prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Greetings to you this morning. Welcome to our service here at Trinity Lutheran Church. We follow the order of service as it's printed out for you in your worship folders this morning. And we'll open with the first hymn. We sing verses 1 through 6.
in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart, and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Almighty God, merciful Father, I poor miserable sinners, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am not like to remember and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings of death. Your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the Word, announce the grace of God unto you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O Lord. Let them be ashamed and confounded that seek after my soul. Praise the Lord. Having obtained pardon for all our sins and thus peace with God, we now come before Him in prayer and praise. O Lord God, the Father in heaven, You abound in grace and love, as the Maker of all things continue to preserve them for our use. O Christ our King, You bring salvation for all. As God's own Son and our Mediator at the heavenly throne, hear us and grant our supplications. O Lord God, the Holy Ghost, You create and guard our faith, the gift we need the most. Bless our life's last hour that we leave this sinful world with gladness and peace. Please be seated. Let us give glory to our God.
Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and merciful God, whose best and greatest gift is that your faithful people be able and willing to give you true and praiseworthy service. Grant, we ask you, that we may so faithfully serve you in this life, we would not fi fail finally to attain your promise of heaven. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Our Old Testament reading for this morning comes to us from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 29. Is it not yet just a little while before Lebanon will be turned into a fertile field and the fertile field will be considered as a forest? On that day, the deaf will hear the words of a book. Out of their gloom and darkness, the eyes of the blind will see. The afflicted also will increase their gladness in the Lord, and the needy of mankind will rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. For the ruthless will come to an end, and the scorner will be finished. Indeed, all who are intent on doing evil will be cut off, who cause a person to be indicted by a word, and ensnare him who adjudicates at the gate, defrauds the one at right with meaningless arguments. Therefore, thus says the Lord who redeemed Abraham concerning the house of Jacob, Jacob shall not now be ashamed, nor shall his face now turn pale. But when he sees his children, the work of my hands in his midst, they will sanctify my name. Indeed, they will sanctify the Holy One of Jacob and will stand in awe of the God of Israel. Those who err in mind will know the truth. Those who criticize will accept instruction. This is the word of the Lord. Our psalm portion is from Psalm 146. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves his righteous. The Lord protects the strangers. He supports the fatherless and the widow. The Lord will reign forever. Our epistle is from St. Paul in his second letter to the Corinthian congregation, chapter 3. Such confidence we have through Christ toward God. Not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God, who also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. But if the ministry of death in letters engraved on stones came with glory, so that the sons of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moses because of the glory of his face, fading as it was, how will the ministry of the Spirit fail to be even more with glory? For if the ministry of condemnation has glory, much more does the ministry of righteousness abound in glory. For indeed, what had glory, in this case, has no glory, because of the glory that surpasses it. For if that which fades away was with glory, how much more that which remains is in glory. This too is the word of the Lord. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Sing aloud unto God our strength, and make a joyful noise unto the God of Jacob. Hallelujah. We rise for the gospel. Our gospel lesson today comes from Mark chapter 7, beginning at verse 31. Again, Jesus went out from the region of Tyre and came through Sidon 
to the Sea of Galilee within the region of Decapolis. They brought to him one who was deaf and spoke with difficulty. They implored him to lay his hand on him. Jesus took him aside from the crowd by himself and put his fingers into his ears. And after spitting, he touched his tongue with the saliva. He looked up to heaven with a deep sigh and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And his ears were opened, and the impediment of his tongue was removed, and he began speaking plainly. And he gave them orders not to tell anyone, but the more he ordered them, the more widely they continued to proclaim it. They were utterly astonished, saying, He has done all things well. He makes even the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. So ends the gospel. We confess our Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all the worlds, God of God, light of light, very God, very God, begotten of God, made, being of one substance with the Father. But we will thank you for David, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnated by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under the just title. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again in glory and judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have to end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated for the hymn of the day.
grace, peace, mercy, and truth be multiplied unto you through Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. Amen. God's word upon which we base our meditation briefly this morning is the last verse of the gospel reading. And they were utterly astonished, saying, He has done all things well. He makes even the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts now be acceptable in your sight, your strength, and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. To a fellow redeemed in the Lord, in this uh, season of the year and cycle of our nation, Politicians are out and about extolling all the wonderful things they may have done in their tenure so far and promising the moon as far as what they're going to do coming up in the next few years. Very often, our response to all this may be, yeah, but what have you done for me lately? That's, that's a good question. What have you done for me lately? We can talk all we want to about things done a year ago or two years ago or three years ago or four years ago or six years ago in the case of senators. But what have you done for me lately? Where's, where's, uh, where's some production there? Where, where's some goodies for, for me, myself? My grocery basket is nearly empty, and yet the bill is out of sight. The taxes keep going up. People I know are out of work. Others suffering in other ways. The health insurance doesn't cover diddly squat. I got problems here, buddy. What are you going to do for me? Fair questions. Very seldom get answered, do they? But they're fair questions. What about God? You ever ask about that? You ever ask about Jesus that way? You ever in your prayers, for example, say, well, you know, Jesus, what have you done for me lately? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I know all about coming into this world and Dying for sins, and yeah, but what have you done for me lately? Anything? Something? Is it good, bad? Is it more good than bad, more bad than good? What, what's the situation here? Is it what, what you expected? Has God come through the way you expected? Or has he kind of let you down? Less than you expected. Fair questions. Yeah, fair questions. I, I don't condemn anyone that has questions like that. I question myself sometimes. You don't, you don't think things get kind of tiring? No, I, I'd like to look out on Phil pews. I'd like to have more than six or eight people in Bible class. No, I'd like to have a whole cadre of new people come in. in. Not that I don't pray for that every night, every day. Kind of like that to come through just, just once. My son, it's just me speaking. I don't know about you. I'm sure you have other things. And you might say also, what have you done? Our text gives us the answer. The people of the Decapolis, they cried out, he has done all things well. <laughs> all things well. Let's talk about that a little bit. You have to understand where we are in Jesus' ministry. We're towards the end. He's only got a few more months left. And he takes a great deal of time from all intents and purposes, from, from, from what it looks like, doing nothing. You know, the, 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 
the Bible says here that he went out for the region of Tyre. Look, that's about 120 miles from where he's going to be. That's a long way to walk. You know, he doesn't have a car. He's not taking a train. He's not flying in a helicopter or Air Force One or something like that. Okay? About 120 miles. And he's not going directly. He's going by way of Sidon. This is down the coast and then across and down to the Sea of Galilee and then around the Sea of Galilee to the Decapolis, 10 cities. And it's not even, I mean, it's, technically it's part of Israel. Technically it's a part of the, uh, uh, the area of Herod's rule, so you could say it's a Jewish area, but it's really not. The Decapolis is, is named that. It's 10 cities, it's in Greek. The Capolis, okay, and and so it it's a, it's an area of of Greek influence. It's an area of pagans. It's an area of mostly Gentiles. Very few Jews live there. Very few. He's been in this area a couple of times before. That's where he drove the herd of uh, or drove the demons into the herd of pigs and drove the pigs over into the Sea of Galilee. You know, okay, from the demoniac. He was a Gentile. So he. It, it, it could have taken him anywhere from six to eight months to walk that distance from way up in Lebanon all the way down the coast and all the way across the Baca Valley and all the way over to, towards the Jordan and then all the way down the side of the Sea of Galilee all the way to the Cabo. Could have taken as long as six months, maybe longer. And there's not a peep in any of the gospel writers about what in the world he was doing that whole time. Think about that. He's got a three-year ministry and he takes six months, eight months out of it. That's a big chunk. That's a giant percentage of his earthly ministry and it's totally silent. There's not a peep about it in the Bible. Not a peep. What in the world was he doing? Well, he must have been teaching his, his disciples, certainly, but he was doing something else. His enemies were on his trail all the time. But the Jewish people, the, uh, the Jewish leaders, the, the scribes and Pharisees, whatever, they're not going to go into Gentile territory. Right? That's unclean. Right? So they're not going to do that. So Jesus spends that whole time in Gentile territory to stay away from his enemies because it's not his time yet. It's a, about a year, give or take, when he starts the journey anyway. It's about a year, nine, ten months anyway, away from his last Passover and, and Holy Week. And so really what he's doing, he's, he's doing the, the Jesus version of hiding in a basement. He's, he's doing Jesus' version, version of staying away from answering any questions, staying away from saying anything that might get him in trouble, staying away from, from any controversy, staying away from the uh, enemy's clutches. Hmm? That's what he's doing. Keeping a low profile. Because he doesn't want to be captured and taken off to Jerusalem or, or killed in Galilee or something like that and not fulfill prophecy. Right? So he's doing that for, for us, my friends. Okay, so Matthew tells us that when he gets to the capitalist, in Matthew's version of the story, uh, he gets to the capitalist and he gets up on a high mountain, a high hill, uh, and he sits down and, and again begins to teach. And he's basically again teaching his disciples. But a lot of people have heard about him, and so a lot of people come to listen in. They're listening in basically on what he's teaching his disciples. Disciples, And they've also heard about his healings. They've heard about that he's cast demons out of people. They've heard that he's raised people from the dead. They've heard all kinds of things like this. They, they heard what he did in Capernaum when he healed that lame guy, and so on and so forth. And so the Bible tells us, Mark tells us, and Matthew tells us, they bring a lot of people, the lame, the blind, the deaf, the mute, uh, the lepers, uh, you know, all kinds of problems. People are demon-possessed and so on and so forth. They're bringing them in hordes. And, and the Bible tells us that Jesus, heal them all, heal them all, heal them all. Putting his hands on some, some he's just speaking a word, whatever. But he's healing them all, healing them all. And Mark, for whatever reason, you know, Mark's really recounting the gospel according to Peter. That's what he's doing. He's Peter's uh, kind of companion and buddy, uh, you know, like Luke was Paul. Anyway, and so uh, this is really Peter's gospel, but, but Mark, the Holy Spirit directs Mark to pick out this one 
incident and, and give it to details that Matthew don't, doesn't give, Luke doesn't give. Okay? Uh, so here are the details. They bring this one guy who's both deaf and mute. Okay? And he's mute in a particular way. The Bible says that he speaks, but he speaks with difficulty. So as, as is very common with people who are deaf, uh, they have a very hard time articulating words. They, they don't, since they don't hear the words, they don't hear themselves, it's very hard for them to articulate, so they don't speak clearly. Okay? Uh, the Greek here kind of in, in gives us the idea that his tongue was also kind of tied in a way. So maybe he had a, a speech impediment, maybe have a cut palate, I don't know. Maybe he had some other, uh, there's all kinds of medical uh, uh, terms for all those stuff, but basically your tongue just does not work correctly. Your palate does not work correctly with your tongue, and, and so you can't speak right. And, and we don't know if he was born deaf or he became deaf somehow, but anyway, he couldn't hear at all. And so uh, Jesus decides to deal with this guy, but he deals with him a little differently. He's not just sitting there and he's healing people. He, he gets up, he makes some effort here, he gets up, he takes this guy away from the crowd. Now why does he do that? Why does Jesus do that? Why, why does he take this deaf mute away from the crowd, you know, down the other side of the hill or whatever? He doesn't want to make a spectacle. He does not want to make a spectacle of himself. He's, enough, he's got enough fame as it is, and again, doesn't want to attract the attention of his enemies. And he doesn't want to make a spectacle of this guy. He has sympathy for this man. He has, he has real sympathy, he has real, real feeling, real com compassion. For this fellow. He doesn't want this fellow to be the, the, the object of, of people's staring. Right? He, he takes him aside, takes him maybe behind a tree, who knows? You know, behind a big boulder or something. Takes him back. And, and then he does something else. He sticks his fingers in the guy's ears. He says, I'm going to do something for your ears. Huh? That's what he's telling him. He's kind of sign language. And they, he spits on his, on his, in his hand and he touches the guy's tongue. He said, I'm going to do something for your tongue, too. I'm going to do something for your mouth. I'm going, to, I'm going to make you able to hear. I'm going to make you able to speak. The sign language. Again, showing this guy, hey, I don't mean to harm you. I'm going to do something good for you. And then, and then he does something else real interesting. He sighs. And this word here, really fascinating. This word, this sigh, is the same word that's used later on when he sighs over Jerusalem or when he sighs in the Garden of Gethsemane. Think about those times. Those were sad times for him. Those were times when, when he really felt bad. Now, is he feeling bad for this guy? Yeah, he is. He, this guy's had to live his whole life. We don't know how old he is, but he's had to live his whole life so far without being able to speak right and without being able to hear. And so very difficult for him. But I, he's, more, he's sighing more than that. He, he's sighing over, you know, what is this? I mean, really, what, what is this deaf and dumb thing? I, except another... Uh, Another uh, uh, sign of the fall of sin, isn't it? Fall into sin. It, it, it's really a consequence of, of living in a sinful world. You know, folks, you have to, you have to think about this. And, and, and I, know, I know this is hard for you sometimes. But please, please take, take what I'm going to say to heart. Okay? Very often I know that, that when bad things happen, things that, that are unpleasant, things that are painful things that are difficult for you or your family members or somebody. And, and, and I know it's real easy at that point to think, well, this is because of something I did. This is because I didn't pray enough. This is because I didn't go to church enough. This is because I didn't give enough offerings. This is because I, I, I or this is because I curse too much. Or this is because I lust too much. Or this is because I, I, I cheat too much. Or, or lie too much. Or, or whatever. I, I know that's I, I know that that's easy to think of, but it's not true. Jesus took the punishment for those sins on the cross. You, you cannot be punished for them. I don't care how bad they are. You know, I, 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 I told this to a guy one time, he was addicted to pornography. I, I, said, I said, you know, I, I don't care if you spent four hours you know, looking at, looking at the cruddiest junk on the internet. That was paid for. The fact that you lost your job may be a consequence of that, because human resources found out about it, but it's not punishment from God. 
Get that out of your head. I, I know it's almost impossible to do, but get it out of your head. Get it out of your head. Okay? You cannot be punished for your sins because Jesus already was. Okay? It, the, the sigh that Jesus makes here is a sigh about the consequences of the fall. The sigh is Jesus saying, this is just what happens in a sinful world. Things are broken. Germs, bacteria, viruses do their dirty business. War and crime, hate and prejudice, bigotry and cheating and lying all have their terrible consequences, and those things are sins of the fall. They are products of our old Adam. And so the consequences that come from them are not punishments, my friend. They are not. They are simply the consequences of living in an evil world. And I have said this to parents who are burying a six-month-old child. And I have said this to people who are 30 years old and burying their spouse from cancer. And I have said this to 80 and 90-year-olds who are laying on their deathbed. It doesn't matter when the bad thing happens or unpleasant or difficult or painful thing. It doesn't matter when. It doesn't matter at what point in your life. It doesn't matter anything what the, except the fact that it's not a punishment for sin. It's a consequence of sin. And, and I know you may say, well, there's not a whole lot of difference. It still hurts. Yeah, that's true. But it's not God putting his hand on you. It's not God saying, there, ha, 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 I gotcha. That, that's not what's going on. That is not what's going on. What's going on is this sigh. <sighs> Boy, these people got it tough, Father. Boy, they got it rough. Lighten up on them, huh, a little bit. And then he says, Ephatha, be opened. And again, the guy's instantly healed. Instantly he hears, instantly he's able to speak. Notice also what he does. He looks up into heaven. He says, that's where your help is from. Not from around here. Now, Jesus, of course, being son of God, he could do it himself. But he looks up to his father. Why? Because in his earthly ministry, he's subservient to his father. He... he he says, you know, according to your will, your father, your will be done, like he did again in the garden. And then what Christ does is interesting. He, then he tells the people, don't say nothing to nobody. Keep this to yourself. And of course, <laughs> of course, the Bible says that the more he tells them this, in other words, he repeated this often, don't tell anybody, please don't tell anybody, please, please, please don't tell anybody. The more he said it, the more they went all around in all the villages and all the towns and said, hey, hey, do you hear what Jesus did? They couldn't contain themselves. Not even when Jesus told them not to. They couldn't contain themselves. They had to speak about his glory and his wonderful. And then the other thing he says is, all things he has done exceedingly good. And, and I, want you to, I want to tell you something about this, this verse here. It's interesting. The Greek has the word well first. And it's not just well. That's a, that's a good translation. I won't say it's not. But, but it means exceedingly good. It means perfect. It means absolutely without any flaws. And that's the first word. And the first word in a Greek sentence is always a word of emphasis. So you could translate it this way. Perfect. He has done. And then all things, everything. Everything Jesus has done is perfect. And of course, we could add on to that and will do and continues to do. You believe that? Do you believe that everything that happens in this universe is according to God's sovereign will? 
If you don't, you need to. Because that's the truth. That's the truth. That's what this verse and the rest of the Bible teach. Jesus has done, is doing, and always will do everything perfect. Not perfect according to our judgment, no. No, (laughs) no. Not perfect according to our plans, what we have thought for the future. Not perfect according to our bodies. Not perfect according to our minds. Not perfect according to the way we would like things to go. But perfect according to God's plan of salvation to put the most number of people in heaven that can possibly be there. To save all those whose names are written in the book of life. So, go back to our first question. What's Jesus done for you lately? Hmm? What's Jesus done for you lately that's good? Well, let's see. Has he given you rest for your soul? Yeah, I think you'd have to admit that. Has he saved you from your sins? Huh? Has he given you an inner peace that this world cannot give, that no politician can ever promise and fulfill? Yeah. Why is it then, if that's true, and I know it's true, Why is it then we very seldom see these ultimate good things? Why is it that we tend to focus on the bad things? We tend to focus on our aches and pains. We tend to focus on our problems and difficulties. We tend to focus on our our employment or on our mortgages or on our uh, portfolios or or whatever. We tend to focus on, on all of that stuff rather than peace and love with God and having him as our father and a guaranteed place in heaven and so on. I think it's maybe weak faith, perhaps. That's possible. I think it's maybe we don't hear enough of what Christ has done for us all the time. I think it's perhaps thinking that, well, Some of the things that that are in our lives are impossible for God to deal with. As Abraham said, is anything too hard for the Lord? Obviously not. St. Clement of Alexandria once put it this way. He said, Jesus has done all things well. He has changed sunset into sunrise. And Paul said that Christ makes us a new creation. And yet, folks, I would point out one thing. One of the uh, early Christian fathers also put it this way, what good is it having someone who can walk on water if you don't follow in his footsteps? Why did Peter, Peter sink that day? He sunk that day because he was worried about the waves that he saw. He was worried that Jesus couldn't tackle them, couldn't handle them and keep him upright, keep him afloat. At the end of an interview with the actor Robert De Niro, the host asked him, quote, At the end of your days, Mr. De Niro, if you come before God, what will you say to him when you meet him? De Niro turned his head, a sly smile on his face and in a very cocky tone of voice said this quote what I'm going to say to God is you got some splaining to do no 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 Mr. De Niro God doesn't have to explain anything to you you're the one who will have some explaining to do The fact of the matter is, my dear Christian friends, that God doesn't have to explain to us anything he does. He doesn't have to tell us why. He doesn't have to tell us what's coming next. He doesn't have to tell us how we are going to get through life and get into heaven. He doesn't have to tell us anything. He doesn't have to tell us 
about the wonders of the earth and all the great, wonderful things he gives us for nothing. Uh, and he also doesn't have to tell us about the reasons and what he has planned for wars and for crimes and for diseases and for death. He doesn't have to. No, he doesn't. He's God. All we have to know is what the people of Decapolis knew. And all we have to say to ourselves is what they said to the towns and villages around them. All we need to do is to point to Jesus and say, He does all things perfectly. And leave it at that. And now may the peace of God that goes beyond all understanding keep your hearts and minds in true faith through Christ Jesus, your Lord. Amen. be seated for prayer. Omnipotent God, who is worthy to be held in awe by all people, we give you most humble and hearty thanks for the many blessings which, without any merit or worthiness on our part, you have bestowed upon us. We praise you especially that you have preserved your saving word and the holy sacraments in truth and purity. Continue to protect and extend your kingdom throughout the world, give your church faithful pastors, and grant success to the preaching. Open the door of faith unto unbelievers everywhere, including all the children of Abraham. In mercy, remember the enemies of your church and grant them repentance to eternal life. Be the protector and defender of your people at all times of tribulation and danger. Cause all those in your church to fight the good fight of faith and in the end, receive the salvation of our souls. Bestow your grace upon all the nations of the earth and bless our land and all its inhabitants and all who are in authority. Cause your word to be proclaimed openly throughout our country, so that truth and righteousness would grow among us. Defend us from all calamities by fire, water, plague, war, and famine. Prosper everyone in their calling and cause all useful arts to flourish. Be the protector of the widow and the orphan, the helper of the sick and the needy, and the comforter of the distressed. As we are but pilgrims on this earth, help us by a true faith and a godly life to prepare for the world to come, doing the work you have given us before the end comes when we can work no longer. And when our last hour comes, receive us into your everlasting kingdom, only through the merits of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. We continue the top of page 13. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto thee, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty, everlasting God, who with your only begotten Son and the Holy Ghost are one God, one Lord. And in the confession of the only true God, we worship the Trinity in person and the unity in substance of majesty coequal. And therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising thee and singing.
Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, and he gave thanks, and he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. the clear text in the very words of Christ, do this in remembrance of me. These are bidding and commanding words by which all who would be Christians are enjoyed to partake of this sacrament. Therefore, whoever would be a disciple of Christ with whom he here clearly speaks, we must also consider and observe this. But in obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ and to please him. Congregation may now come forward for the Lord's Supper. <clears throat> Take and eat. This is the true body of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given up unto death, even the death of the cross, for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and eat. This is the true body of your Lord sacrificed for you on the cross for your sins. This is the blood of your Savior shed for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for your sins. Take and eat. This is the true body of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given up for you on Calvary's cross for the forgiveness of all of your sins. This is the true body of your Lord, sacrificed for you on Calvary's cross for the remission of all of your sins. and eat. This is the true body of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given for you on the cross for the forgiveness of all of your sins.
Take and eat. This is the true body of your Lord, sacrificed for you on Calvary for your forgiveness. Take and eat. This is the true body of your Lord, given for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. This is the true body of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given for you on Calvary's cross for the forgiveness of your sins. This is the blood of your Lord, shed for you for the remission of all of your sins. Now may this, the true body and blood of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you in the one true and saving faith unto life everlasting. Amen. Depart in God's peace. Amen. Please join now in the Nunc Dimittis. Give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. We implore you that in your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Lord be with you. Bless we the Lord. The 
Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. Please join now in the closing hymn. be seated. Once again, a very good morning to everyone. Good to see you here 
Uh, fellowship awaits you over in the fellowship hall, some food and drink there, opportunity for you to uh, share your faith and encourage one another in your faith. Nothing else going on, so otherwise I'll see you next Sunday.